I really enjoy singing his work more than any other composer's. It's really wonderful. It's never I always try and sing some Hot Not, and people are really bowled over by this composer from Wales. He is one of the greatest composers in the world. Tis a long covered boat that's common here, carved at the prow, built lightly but compactly. What I think is really remarkable about Alan Hodenot is his ability to be inspired. The music has a lovely a sheen to it. It's very romantic. It glides along the water. He's taken texts here which have permitted him to have a, a wonderful flowering of inspiration. It's beautiful to sing. It's really, I would imagine, lovely to listen to. He's 77 to be looking forward to a new piece in this way, to be still capable of feeling so excited about something that you're compelled to write a work of this length. My view is that Alan's music is some of the most beautiful contemporary music that there is. It's a magical work. I think it is one of the most romantic sounding pieces I've written. Perhaps it's because I'm getting older. <laughs> This evening, there's an extra reason to celebrate St David's Day, a new work from Wales's greatest living composer, Alan Hodenot. It's called La Serenissima, a song cycle for soprano, baritone and orchestra. The premiere is taking place tonight at St David's Hall in Cardiff. You'll be able to hear the concert straight after this programme. But before that, I'd like to take you back to how it all began, tracing the journey from germ of an idea to first performance. So what was the light bulb moment behind La Serenissima? Well, this was a creative process lit up by several different flashes of inspiration. The romantic poetry of the 18th and 19th centuries, the allure of the world's most beautiful city, and a very special relationship between composer and performers. My name is Jeremy Hugh Williams. I'm an opera singer. I was a choral scholar at St John's College, Cambridge, and the college used to commission the best composers of the day, and that included Alan Hodinot. That's where I really got to know him. And Alan Hodinot has been my favourite composer ever. And when I became a professional singer, I was eager to commission new work. But I also was surprised that there was so little work in the repertoire for baritone. So I've done a little to change that. And I've been so lucky that he's written works for me in all kinds of forms, from the smallest chamber pieces to the most elaborate scores. It's such a joy to work with him. He is the master. And the idea behind this composition came several years ago, in fact. Back in the 90s, Alan and I were discussing Venice as a subject for a piece for voice and orchestra. And Alan had some text in mind, and we spoke about the poetry of Lord Byron and Charles Dickens's writing, and Henry James and Shelley. And then in about 1999, I gave some concerts in Italy and a concert at the Accademia Italiana in London. And so I asked Alan whether he'd write a piece for baritone and piano, which he did, and he called La Serenissima. And there are five songs, four in English, and one love song in, centrally in the cycle in Italian. And that's been a very successful cycle, and I've enjoyed singing it very much. And then... The idea lay dormant for a few years because what he really wanted to do was to write a great big orchestral score, a score for symphony orchestra and for voice. And in the meantime, I got to know Helen Field rather well. Helen is one of our greatest singers, internationally recognised soprano. She also happens to be 
a neighbor of mine. We live in the same street in Cardiff. And so when I moved from London to Cardiff, I got to know her socially and we developed a professional relationship as well. We've appeared in opera together, but also on the concert platform very often. And we were interested to perform some orchestral music. So we had the idea that we would like to commission a Welsh composer to write a piece of music for us. And that's how this came about. We sort of planned to invite Alan Hodenot because um, he's, he's um, such a, a well-known and respected Welsh composer that we asked him if he would like to do this, and he, he, he did. So we were thrilled, absolutely thrilled when he accepted. It occurred to me that it would be rather nice to have a great work for soprano, baritone and for orchestra, so that it wasn't just one voice, but there'd be an interaction between a female and a male. And, of course, the great example of this is Mahler's song cycle, Das Lied von der Erde, the Song of the Earth. And so that was the inspiration behind the kind of piece that I was after. It's never a gondola for fear you should not I'll describe it to you exactly Tis a long covered boat that's common here Carved at the prow Built lightly but compactly I'd been wanting to write a larger work which had connections with Venice because I'd written a cycle for Jeremy for voice and piano, which I'd also called Serenissima a couple of years back. And I felt I wanted to develop this on a a larger scale. And of course, this was with orchestra, so you can get much more color. And by using Venice as a source of inspiration, Alan Hondenot was able to draw on a particularly rich palette of orchestral colour. The city on the sea has fired the imaginations of creative types for centuries. Venice has been the inspiration for so many artists and writers over the years. Music critic Rian Evans. I think for musicians, what is so strong is the sense of the Baroque musical tradition. And I think for contemporary composers, the sense of identification with the composers of the Baroque is almost stronger than the classical and romantic composers. And that attention to detail and the sense of a place being abuzz with music in the 17th and 18th centuries. I think that that is something that we can almost sense in the music of Hodinot, even if it's going to sound rather different. The complexity, the textures are there. It's not surprising that Venice has floated into Hodinot's imagination so powerfully. He and his wife Rhiannon have enjoyed travelling throughout Italy for many years. Well, we started going to... Italy for periods in the summer, way back in about the middle 60s. And we went there almost every year then. And uh, of course, I drove there. So we started at the top and then drove down to beyond Naples, where we spent most of our time. But of course, we stopped on the way and spent uh, several visits in Venice. It's very inspiring from a point of view of colour and architecture. And there's just a a general atmosphere with very splendid buildings which have splendid paintings and, and all that sort of thing. And, of course, we stayed several times outside Venice in Oslo and I got to know some Italian composers as well and... I spent some very enjoyable times there. But how does a well-travelled composer translate colour, light, architecture and atmosphere into notes on the stave? How do the images of Venice become the sounds of La Serenissima? This work, it really is very 
Pictorio, it talks about the greatness of St. Mark's Square, which I'm sure most listeners are familiar with, either by photographs, television, or having been there. And the wonderful church and the mosaics and the arches in the square. And it talks about the lagoons. Alan paints these pictures of the canals and we hear in the orchestra the gentle rustling of leaves and the water, the waves. We feel the, the pole of the gondolier going in and out. Perhaps it's just a B-flat which comes back once a bar in the harp, for example, in the middle of the texture. But there are all these things going on and it really does conjure up Venice. It's a magical work. If you've been to Venice, it will have immediate appeal, a direct appeal, but even if you haven't, it sort of conjures up one of those, almost like it's like a Canaletto painting or something like that. You know, that lovely glow, the golden glow of, that you associate with Venice. and. The music has a lovely a sheen to it. It's very romantic. Alan uses shimmering textures. There are some lovely things in the percussion and some lovely tinkly sounds. And the harp is very important. Some high string writing. And it really is very evocative. And on top of this are the voices with these extraordinary words from the 19th century of these writers who were just bowled over by the exuberance of Venice. For Alan Hodinot, the choice of text is absolutely crucial. He loves the challenge of setting evocative words to music. The most difficult thing with a vocal piece is getting the words, and it takes me, in fact, longer to find the words than it does to write the music. Uh, once I've got the words, I can write fairly quickly, but getting the words and getting words that you can set to music, I find is difficult. In this, there are five movements or sections, so obviously one has to get words that can be set fast and slow and and so on. So once the the pattern of tempo is set, you can concentrate then more on the music. In La Serenissima, Hodinot explores literature that has taken Venice as its theme, from the vivid prose of Mark Twain and Charles Dickens to the romantic poetry of Shelley and Byron. But when he's trawling through his library, how does he decide what has the most text appeal? Well, the important thing for me is the setability of the words. I've never been able, for example, to set any words by Dylan Thomas because, for me anyway, they're too poetic and almost impossible to set to music, which is why I like 18th and 19th century poetry mostly, because the rhymes are fluent and fairly easy to set. So in a sense, they've got a musicality within them. Yes, but not too musical. If if the poetry is too musical, then it doesn't need any music to go with it. So I, I rather take to the words that need this extra dimension. Choice of words is paramount. And for the singer, for the singer, words are almost more important than the music. I spend almost as much time working on the words as I do on the music. And in fact, I always work on the words before working on the music because it saves so much time to begin with. Once I know what the words really mean, then the music comes alive because with good composers, with great composers like Mozart, they used people like Da Ponte, I mean Schubert, Seth Goethe, and Schumann and Heine, all of these relationships produced the most exquisite music because the poets were great. And not only were the poets great, but the composer knew instinctively how to respond to the poets. And this is the, something that Alan knows instinctively. It's a gift. There is a city in the sea. The sea is in the broad, the narrow 
The gifted composer may set the words, but it's up to the talented singer to communicate them. And on this front, Alan Hodinot and Jeremy Hugh Williams have proved a particularly good team. Alan Hodinot has always had a real fascination for words and is a gift for setting words. Jeremy, in turn, has a clarity of articulation. I mean, he's practically the clearest singer that you could ever come across. And so that, again, is a positive starting point, if you like. For the listener hearing music for the first time, if you can't hear the words, it means absolutely nothing at all. So in the first instance, you've got um, a composer who cares about the way he sets the music, that there really is a very profound engagement with, with the words of, of the poet or whoever is being set. But then the singer too has that same kind of um, engagement with the words and it really puts them over in a way which is very strong, very engaging. That's quite unusual. The success of a performance may depend on this kind of teamwork, but at the writing stage, composing can be a pretty lonely business. So does musical creativity have a daily routine? And what's the workplace like? Well, the room is in the garden. It's away from the house. It's quiet. I, I must have absolute silence when I'm working, so uh, there are no distractions, no telephone calls and nothing else. And I do need reference points sometimes perhaps from my earlier pieces where I've done something that I'm duplicating. So there it is. Anything on the walls? Not much. I like a lot of paintings on the walls and things, but not in uh, my workroom. Anyway, the, the walls are covered with, with bookshelves and lots of music there that I can refer to. You actually handwrite your scores now. In, in an era of, um, of computers aiding composition with programmes like Sibelius... How, how laborious is that process? I've always written with pen and ink, as it were, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I think that the amount of time that, well, that I take anyway in writing is very useful because it means you can give the music second thoughts as you are writing it, so that once I've done it, I... I don't uh, need to go back to it again. So what would be your your day composing? Could you give me a, an idea of the routine of it? I start early in the morning, and then I don't like working in the afternoon, but then I work in the evening. When I was younger, I worked through the night quite a lot, but uh, not so much now. And with a commission, are you actually set a deadline? Yes, I'm fairly late with the pieces, but... They're always there in time. I think it's only once have I been a little bit too late for the performance. So how long would a work of this size actually take you? I think with a piece using words, it takes longer than, than a purely instrumental work. So I think a, a work of this size would take at least six months, uh, from beginning to end, as it were. So those are the practicalities of producing a work like La Serenissima, but what's the key to the creative process? Can the secret be revealed? There is an unconscious element in it, which really I can't explain much. I'm fascinated by the process, but does it take away its mystery if you have to explain it too much, I suppose? No, um, I think that on a technical level it, it's easy enough to explain but why one writes a certain pattern of notes is from the subconscious and when you say you obviously you hear the music on your head do you hear the entire orchestral score i hear the kind of sound i want to get on paper and then of course i mean you you know instinctively how the instruments work together because La Serenissima has been commissioned by its singers, Jeremy Hugh Williams and Helen Field, Alan Hodinot will also know instinctively how their voices work together. So how much does he have their voices in mind when he's composing? All the time. Singers have got different colours to their voices and they sing differently in different registers. So you, you should have 
the colour of their voice and the way they sing in mind all the time. And do you want to stretch them a bit as well? No, I never consciously think of that, but I use a voice thoroughly, as it were. I use the top register and the lower register as the words demand. The repertoire of most singers is devoted to long dead composers. For Jeremy Hugh Williams and Helen Field, there's not only the excitement of working with a composer who's very much alive, but the honour of having the work written especially for them. It's a wonderful thrill. One feels part of history because we're involved in the creation of these works. And what does it feel to know that he's writing with your voice in mind? Occasionally when I get one of Alan's new scores, I look at it and think, oh, well, he's thought of me, particularly for that phrase, because that's something that I can do. But actually, most of the time, I look at the music and I think, that's very difficult. It's as though he's stretching me. So La Serenissima is a work which reflects the importance of the relationship between composer and performer. It's a bond that has been vital to Hardenot throughout his career. In Hardenot's case, he's actually, over the years, developed rather important relationships. The pianist John Ogden was somebody who performed Hardenot's music very specifically. The piano sonatas were written for him. It was joked that he would have black ink on his fingers giving the very first performance. That kind of intensity is something which is characteristic of, of many of the relationships. I think that Alan Hodgenot has continued over the years to have musicians, singers, instrumentalists very much at the forefront of his mind when he, he writes. It's a very beneficial relationship for both composer and performer. And the thing that most composers are sad about is that so many performers today don't perform contemporary music. They, they stick far too much to music of the past. But thanks to Alan Hodinot, Wales can celebrate St David's Day with music that is very much of the present. His contribution to contemporary music is immense. Since he wrote his first composition, a string trio in 1949, he's produced more than 200 works, from operas, symphonies, sonatas and concertos to ceremonial and film music. La Serenissima takes its place in a rich body of work, in which several characteristic Hodinot traits can be traced. Hodinot is interesting that there are two or three different trademarks. He has one style which is characteristically lyrical. He, in some instances, is characterised as a very Welsh composer, very Celtic. So there's a strain of melancholy which is very much a sort of intrinsically Celtic, very Welsh style. And his slow movements have that real sort of almost a sense of anguish, but always very long, very expressive. When I say long, I mean drawn out so that you really hear the soul of the instrument or the voice as that's coming across. One of the other characteristic styles, a very sort of dynamic, fast, rhythmic, highly percussive style, uh, it dances along. It catches your ear and you, you almost dance along with it. That said, you might also trip because very often they're quite uh, tricky rhythms, so it's not entirely even, but that's part of the fun of it. La Serenissima marks something of a new departure for Hodenot. I think people will be very surprised. It's um, almost romantic, actually. And uh, I think this will be something to take maybe uh, Alan Hodenot in a new direction. I don't know. <laughs> yes, I think it is one of the most romantic-sounding pieces I've written. 
Why do you think that is? Perhaps it's because I'm getting older. <laughs> but of course, when you're younger, you, you are more interested, I think, in the technical side and in perfecting your methods of writing. So perhaps you were more concerned with the technical sound and construction of things. And in the same way as a writer gets older, more life experience comes into the work. Is it like that for musical composition? I would like to think so, yeah. So at your time of life, how do you think where you are now is being reflected in, in the music you write? I, I hope it's, uh, it's getting better. The creation of La Serenissima has shown the importance of the connection between composer and performers. Tonight, a third party completes the journey from germ of an idea to the premiere of the finished work. You, the listener. So what should you take from the experience of hearing La Serenissima for the very first time? I would urge listeners who are perhaps new to Allen's music to listen to it not with an ear that thinks this is contemporary and therefore it's going to be a little strange. My view is that Allen's music is some of the most beautiful contemporary music that there is. And I use the word beautiful carefully because Allen's music is concerned with beauty. This is a romantic cycle. It's about Venice, La Serenissima, the most beautiful city in the world, arguably. It's a magical place. This is a magical work. And one of my main jobs as a performer for this evening's performance is to make it beautiful for the audience, is to make it easy for the audience. I want people to go away thinking, that didn't sound difficult. It's hard for the performer, because if we're only playing notes or singing notes, well, we're not going to be very beautiful. We have to make music, and we will be making music, and it is music, and it's ravishing. Obviously, not everyone is going to like it, but I hope they enjoy the sounds that I've made. <laughs>